some of the things which I may mention this morning, some of the references I make, we may have talked about two weeks ago. Some of the scriptures I'll use today, we may have talked about last week. And I say praise God for that. When a message such as this, which is so critically important for our lives as believers, it's important to speak it out, and sometimes more than once. And I will do that this morning. You may say that Pastor Romancia and I are preaching in one accord, which we are. And we will talk about one accord a bit later today. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us today. Come and give us a special new refreshing of your spirit this morning. And speak a fresh word through me. Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and a sound mind to better understand what you have prepared and what you have promised for us. The Holy Spirit is offered as a free gift, which means we don't have to pay for it. We don't put a deposit down and make monthly payments on it. We're not required to earn this free gift. If we had to pay for such a miraculous gift, none of us could have afforded it. So praise God, the Holy Spirit is free. It's a gift which is offered and should and must be accepted. As with any gift, we must openly and gratefully accept this gift. As Mike mentioned, today we're celebrating mothers and grandmothers on this special Mother's Day. Some of you mothers may receive a gift from your children or grandchildren today to show their thankfulness for what you've done in their lives. These gifts of a card, a phone call, a visitation are freely given to you. In the natural, gifts are given and received. The same can be said for the gift of the Holy Spirit which is offered to all today. The spiritual gift is far more important than any gift you or I will ever receive in the natural. Interesting facts about gifts. Any gift offered but not received will not benefit the intended receiver. A gift is not forced upon the receiver but it's freely offered for their enjoyment, their pleasure, and for the benefit. When offered a gift, there's some different things that we can do. We can graciously and gladly accept that gift. We can take the gift and enjoy it, and perhaps even share of that gift with others. And then conversely, we may accept the gift and think, what am I going to do with this silly gift? How many neckties do I need? <laughs> or we could even decline to accept the gift with no regards to the giver. Or we may rationalize that the gift was only for an earlier age, as Pastor mentioned with those who have thought and who've decided that the gift of the Holy Spirit ceased. But y'all, I think we have live and we teach and we preach a living word. It's what is written in the word applied to the church when it was written, and as well as it applies to us today. Which means... Our firm belief in this house of worship is that what we read about in Scripture, the free gift of the Holy Spirit, which was passed down, which we will discuss today, is still alive. It's still available for us today. As Pastor mentions, some over 300 million people 
accepted and freely spoke with a new tongue, as he mentioned with a gift which had ceased. The word is alive. Hebrews 4.12, the first part of the scripture says, For the word of God is living and it's active. Peter spoke in 1 Peter verse 25, But the word of the God, the word of the Lord, remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached unto you. So I repeat, in case you missed it the first time. The Word of God, as we just read, is alive, never changing, and will never fail us. So we fully believe that the scriptures that we study today apply to the early church as well as the same applies to you and I today. The Word's alive and active. It's not in some dormant state. It hasn't concluded. The word of the Lord remains forever. And the word of the Lord never changes. The word will indeed change us, but the word doesn't change. In the book of Acts, which is the greatest detailing of the Holy Spirit in all of the Gospels, we read that Christ is speaking to his closest followers. And he's already given them the great commission to go forward and preach the word unto the entire earth. But now, he's pulling them back. He's telling them to tarry in Jerusalem. Hold on. Don't go out and start your ministry for a short period of time. Acts chapter 1, verse 5 reads, And while staying with them, who was them? His closest followers. And we can even identify how many of his closest followers he was staying with, thems. He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, and he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So stay. Do not go. And I love the word that the thems were ordered not to leave. Jesus didn't ask them not to depart Jerusalem. He didn't recommend that they stay in Jerusalem. He ordered them. Other biblical references says that he commanded them not to leave the city. Stay. And in a few days, not many days, the Holy Spirit will come. We go down to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and to all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the world. So Jesus was promising the thems some things. You're going to receive a special gift, a free gift. And as part of the gift, you're going to receive power. What kind of a promise is that? You will receive power. And stay in Jerusalem because this gift will be delivered soon. And Jesus specifically said, in not many days, they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and they'd receive power. Jesus' closest followers had already experienced power. In Jesus' ministry, many of these people were sent out two people at a time, and they experienced power given from Christ unto them to do a lot of miraculous things. They had healed the sick. 
they had raised the dead. They knew what power was. And now they had to anxiously wait for not many days until the power came. Then we go into Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Other scriptural references says that they were all in one accord. We know specifically a couple of things about them being in accord. They were gathered together, numerically 120 of them, and Jesus was with them, as we already found out in a past scripture. So they were together in one place, his closest, most devout followers, and they were in a place called the upper room, and they were praying in one accord. Definition of accord is to be harmonious, to be in full agreement. In that group of 120 in the upper room, they weren't scattered all over the place with their prayers. They were all praying the same thing. And I would assume is that they were praying for the quick outpouring of the Holy Spirit as promised them by Jesus. They'd gathered together in the upper room and I could see that there was probably prayer going around the clock. When some members slept, others continued the prayer. All the same message, all the same request. Lord, pour out that Holy Spirit which you promised us in not many days. And as each day progressed, they called out more diligently, Lord, pour out upon us. These 120 closest followers of Christ, praying in one accord, also were praying with great, rich expectation. I think Mike mentioned expectation this morning. A prayer we need to model. We need to imitate. When we pray, pray knowing that our request will be fulfilled. Because scripturally we told that is correct. During the same time of Pentecost, the city of Jerusalem would have been packed with Jewish worshipers as they came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Pentecost. Pentecost was a traditional worship or feast based on the first fruits of the wheat crop, which they grew on an annual basis. The celebration of Pentecost was 50 days after the celebration of Passover. In Exodus 23, we first learn about Pentecost, also called the Feast of Harvest. You shall keep the Feast of Harvest of the first fruits of your labor of what you sow in the field. So that's what's happening right now during the time of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost is being celebrated. I think we can assume that many of these people gathered in celebration of Pentecost were probably also present 50 days prior for Passover. And we remember that was not an ordinary Passover. During that Passover period, Jesus was arrested, falsely accused, tried and convicted, and sentenced to a terrible death upon the cross. But death could not hold him, because in three days he arose. Hallelujah. And we know through Scripture that Jesus walked upon the earth for 40 days, teaching. So we have a very, very interesting timeline Passover took place 50 days before Pentecost. Jesus walked on the earth for 40 days, 
So 10 days remained from when Jesus ascended into heaven and Pentecost was celebrated and the Holy Spirit poured out. A very defined timeline. And the 120 assembled and prayed in one accord. Something marvelous and promised by the resurrected Lord took place. In Acts 2, starting in verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire upper room where they were all sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. How many in the upper room were filled with the Holy Spirit? All. All of them. Not just a select few. Not just his closest ten. They were all filled. Sound like a rushing wind came. And then tongues of fire appeared before them or over their heads. All of you biblical scholars. What was significant about the tongues of fire which appeared over their heads? Any ideas? I'll open it up. Any ideas? What was significant about tongues of fire appearing with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist is teaching his disciples, his followers. And he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. Remember, that's John's entire teaching. Repent and be baptized because another is following me. And this other who's following him, he says, I am not even worthy to carry his sandals. And while I, John the Baptist, baptized with water, He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You're all correct. That's the significance of fire. But also fire is illustrated throughout Scripture in both the Old and New Testament as a sign of purification. So after this, when all in the upper room were touched and filled by the Holy Spirit, Peter begins to preach a great sermon to many of those devout Jews who were there to celebrate Pentecost. Peter preached with authority through the Holy Spirit. I pray this week repeatedly, Holy Spirit, allow me to preach with authority in what you want and what our people need to hear. A life-giving fresh outpour of your word. And what Peter was teaching was about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. He was preaching what we call the truth. And the Jews who heard it, again, many who probably experienced all that took place 50 days before at Passover, And saw Jesus crucified. And then me maybe witnessed or heard. Jesus isn't dead anymore. He's resurrected. They were now hearing Peter talk about what had transpired. And where Jesus was crucified. And scripture tells us that many of them were cut to the heart by what they heard. And they call out to Peter, what should or what can we do? Please tell us, what can we do to make amends for what we know is the truth? And Peter speaks to them in Acts 2.38 and says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. 
And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now we're talking about the Holy Spirit being poured out to more than 120 closest followers of Christ. Peter, speaking to the Jews, says, Repent, be baptized, and you also will receive the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So according to Peter's teaching here, a person has to actively do some things if they want to receive this marvelous gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter says they must repent. You have to accept Jesus and acknowledge that he died to forgive your sins. And Peter also says you need to be baptized. Like salvation, the Spirit is freely given, but only when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Then the question begins to arise, well, what happens when somebody receives this gift of the Holy Spirit promised by Jesus and now preached by Peter? First of all, some signs will appear. We're not talking billboards, y'all. We're talking some spiritual signs. The person's behavior will change. The believer is going to have the ability to speak in unknown tongues. And also, probably more importantly, the believer is going to receive power. So on the day of Pentecost, those in the upper room began to speak in tongues. And in this miraculous case of speaking in tongues, their unknown tongues were actually spoken in the languages of people in Jerusalem who were from various countries and regions who spoke different languages. There are at least 15 different regions or countries referenced in Acts of people who were attending the Pentecost. And they all heard these miraculous tongues. In verse 6 in Acts 2, And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them, who's the them? The 120, speaking in his or her own language. And they were amazed and astonished, and saying, Are these not the Galileans? Who were not known to be articulate in speech especially in various languages. How is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? So here the obvious miracle with this tongue spoken is that they were heard in the language of the individual listener. Two people could be standing side by side who spoke different languages. And each one of those two people heard speaking, heard preaching of the good news in his own language. Is that miraculous? Praise God. That's absolutely incredible. This phenomenon of speaking in tongues is referenced 34 separate times in the New Testament. And if you're wondering if it applies to our time, does anybody here believe what Jesus says? Raise your hand. Yeah, we do. In Mark 16, verse 17, Jesus says, And these signs will accompany those who will believe. In my name, they're going to cast out demons. They're going to speak in new tongues. And they will be able to pick up deadly serpents with their hands. (laughs) If they drink deadly poison, it's not going to hurt them. And they're going to lay their hands on the sick and the sick will be healed. Doth saith the voice of Jesus Christ. Yes, so Jesus doesn't say they may receive tongues. They may receive power. He's very specific in saying when the Holy Spirit is laid up on them, they will have the ability to speak in unknown tongues. They will have the ability to touch people lay hands on them, and heal the sick. 
Jesus speaks is that speaking in tongues is a definitive sign of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. However, I don't believe that speaking in tongues in itself is the entire power which Jesus speaks of. Again, he identified other things. You can cast out demons. You can pick up deadly serpents. You're protected from being poisoned. You're going to lay your hands on the sick people and they will recover, including the dead ones. But it says there are references in Scripture as that these closest followers raise the dead. Hallelujah. And the word is alive. Is there power that we have placed upon us with the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Oh, and yes, and unless I forget, we also will speak in new tongues. Going back to a past scripture, Acts 1 8. Jesus is telling the closest followers, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power was definitely given to those in the upper room. And what were they given power to do? To go forward and spread the news, to teach the truth. Oh, and also to heal, to cast out demons, and to speak in tongues. People were healed from sickness. Demons were cast out. The blind saw and the lame walked. A lot of like what we sing in one of the songs this morning. The lame walked. The blind saw. The death heard. In Acts 5, we read, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hand of the apostles. And again, the apostles referencing this original 120 to begin with. As they were all together, still in one accord. That scripture doesn't say that a few signs and wonders took place. It doesn't say that every once in a while, signs and wonders took place. It says, on a regular basis, signs and wonders took place by these touched and anointed with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 5.15, we reference that some of the people even carried the sick out of their homes, and they placed the sick... (laughs) around the streets, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall up on some of them. Are we then to believe that the shadow of Peter would heal the sick? Yes, you are. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power promised. That's the, pro- the promise placed into us as we receive the Spirit. One more verse down, Acts 5, 16. The people, the people of the surrounding areas, gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Not some of them were healed. Not a few were healed. They all were healed healed. We know in Scripture every person who was brought before Jesus was healed. In this reference now, the disciples, the followers of Christ, anyone who came before them was healed. All who were sick, all who were afflicted, all of those people who were brought before the 120 were healed of their sicknesses, and their illness. There is power in the Holy Spirit.
this is a quick study today. But some of the things that we need to leave with are that the Word of God is alive. The Bible is truth. What we read in the Gospels, what we read throughout the New Testament applies to you and I today. Sometimes we don't feel that power within us. We have things that come down on us and it pushes us down and Satan tries to grind us into dust. <laughs> Has anybody, everybody, anybody here ever had that feeling that, oh, just, oh, woe is me. I am so powerless to do anything. That's directly from the pit of hell. Completely contrary to the Word of God. If you ever feel weak, if you ever feel pushed down, if you ever feel that you have no control of your life, please memorize this scripture and call it out in the face of Satan or one of his little minions who's trying to implant evilness in your mind to tell you you have no power, that the power died. Where do you think that idea came from, that the power died? It's a plan of Satan. There's no power left. It died. That died with Jesus' closest followers. Don't you know? That doesn't make sense. Pastor, it didn't make sense. You got up wanting to pray and prayed in an unknown tongue. That makes no sense. Don't you know, Pastor, those things died? Those things died only if you don't believe the Word of God is truth and the Word of God is alive and well. And the Word of God spoken to the followers applies to you and I today. So when you feel downtrodden, you feel powerless, go to Romans 8, 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That's a question. If, does the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwell in you this morning? Amen, Amen it does. It's not a question. It's a fact. The Spirit who raised Christ from the dead resides in you and me today. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is also give life to your mortal bodies through His Holy Spirit, which dwells within you, believer. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells within us. I encourage everyone here, if you haven't experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's probably will be further teaching on the Holy Spirit. I was talking to Pastor this morning. I said, you know, Pastor, this will be three weeks of preaching in the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of things we haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> we haven't talked about grieving or blaspheming the Holy Spirit yet. We haven't talked about the gifts of the Spirit. There's a lot of things we haven't gotten to yet. Y'all stay tuned. Because we are in one accord. And we will be preaching the truth with the knowledge that the Word of God is alive. So that same gift, freely given to the 120 closest followers, first of all, and then also to all of those who heard Peter teaching, because he said, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. A future teaching, we will be able to talk about what's the difference in being filled with the Spirit and being baptized with the Holy Spirit, because there are slight differences. So this teaching in the Holy Spirit, which started three weeks ago by Pastor Baker, 
And this was followed by a terrific teaching last week by Romancia. We again began as well and spoke about today. And it includes a promise of power and also a sign of having the ability to speak in an unknown tongue. But y'all, as I referenced, there's a lot more that we will teach about the Holy Spirit, which will continue building us up. I won't say if you feel down some days. When you feel down some days, think back about this teaching on the Holy Spirit. And know that when you repented and you were baptized, the Spirit of God came to dwell within you. The Spirit of God, which was so important that Jesus actually told his followers, it's important for me to leave (laughs) so the Spirit can come upon you. And I'm sure that was baffling to his closest followers. How can something more important than Jesus but the Spirit dwelled within all. So, brothers and sisters, hearing what we've talked about the last three weeks is that the things we read about throughout the book of Acts, the 34 different mentions of speaking in an unknown language in the New Testament, those things still apply to you and I today. And if you haven't experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, With the sign of speaking in tongues, please accept the baptism. Do you have to speak in tongues to go to heaven? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But the powers and the signs which were promised, don't we want to all abide and entertain each one of those abilities that were given? And in this church, for the 30 close, close to 30 years Michelle and I have been around, we believe about laying hands on the sick. We believe in anointing the sick with oil because those are scripturally correct. Those are truths. So if you have any doubt about, is this proper to speak in tongues? Remember what Jesus said. My believers will speak in tongues. That didn't come from Paul. That didn't come from Peter. That didn't come from anybody else in 120, that big room. That came from Jesus Christ himself. And he said, it didn't say, maybe my people will speak in tongues. He said, my people will speak in tongues. Praise God for all of you tongue speakers. <laughs> Praise God to the thems who are not yet tongue speakers. <laughs> tongue speaker. But remember, it's scripturally correct. Remember that Jesus said it would happen. But again, speaking in tongues is not the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a sign that someone has been filled with the Holy Spirit with that baptism. Pastor.